Uh, this is a continuation of the last video um, where I read uh, Merleau Ponty, uh, the last the last page from at least this version, this English translation of 2002, uh, where he quoted um, this author whose name I still don't know how to pronounce co correctly. I feel a bit I feel a bit silly because I think that uh, he's, he's a French author um, who lived from about 1900 to somewhere around 1940, I guess I would say. Um, and I don't, don't know how to pronounce his name, but it is, uh, but it's, you, you'll see it in the title, put it that way, uh, until I'm uh, instructed as to how to uh, pronounce his name, I'm going to avoid, you know, any attempts, um, at, you know, butchering his, uh, it's probably pretty exquisite name. Anyway, um, I'm starting on page 21 of this, uh, of the Wisdom of the Sands, and, uh, it's, Chapter four, and as, as I said, uh, I think that you know, as I'm as I'm reading about uh, Plato and I'm thinking about the, the forms um, and uh, its relation to other philosophers who I'm familiar with, <coughs> other philosophies that I'm familiar with, such as um, Maurice Merleau-Ponty's and uh, Martin Heidegger's and uh, Hans Jonas, uh, Hans Jonas, however you want to say it, um, or even Gadamer. Um, I, I, I see. I see part of what uh, part of, of what this author is trying to say. Um, uh, those authors, Whitehead and Plato and, and others, are and so many others are often with characteristic of the of the analytic uh, analytic philosophers, especially uh, in Descartes and that and that whole that whole lineage of, of that sort of thinking. Uh, you know the armchair philosophers. Uh, it seems that this author is, at least, some, at least in some way, in some manner, at least through my interpretation of it, uh, is uh, you know sort of calling attention to to a to a kind of attitude which is uh, which is not pri the primary one. I guess you could say it's not is is not the originary or or uh, the, you know where where the logical would Reasoning, the cold reasoning of, uh, of philosophical reflection is, is cold and bare and derivative compared to this more primordial experience that he's trying to describe. <clears throat> and he says, he's talking about uh, his citadel, or his dwelling place. This, he's, he's the king of a, of a land in, in the desert. It's a very difficult place to live. And he's writing he's, uh, as, as the king of this, of this land. He says, man's dwelling place, who could found you on reasoning, or build your walls with logic? You exist and you exist not, you are and you are not. True, you are made out of diverse materials, but for your discovery an inventive mind was needed. Thus, if a man pulled his house to pieces with the design of understanding it, all he would have before him would be heaps of bricks and stones and tiles. He would not be able to discover therein the silence, the shadows, and the privacy they bestowed. Nor would he see what service this mass of bricks, stones, and tiles could render him. Now that they lacked the heart and soul of the architect, the inventive mind which dominated them. For in mere stone, the heart and the soul of, ma of man have no place. But since reasoning can deal only with such material things as bricks and stones and tiles, and there is no reasoning about the heart and soul that dominate them, and thus transform them into silence, inasmuch as the heart and soul have no concern with the rules of logic or the science of numbers, this is where I step in and impose my will. I, the architect, I, who have a heart and soul, I who wield the power of transforming stone into silence. I step in and mold the clay, which is the raw material, into the likeness of the creative vision that comes to me from God, not through any faculty of reason. Thus, taken solely by the savor it will have, I build my civilization, as poets build their poems, bending phrases to their will and changing words without being called upon to justify the phrasing of their changes, but taken solely by the savor these will have, 
vouched for by their hearts. For I am the ruler, I enact the laws, I prescribe the feast days, I ordain the sacrifices and build up their flocks and herds, their dwelling places and their mountains, a life well ordered like my father's palace, where every footstep had a meeting, had a meaning. Left to themselves, indeed, what could they have made of the heap of stones, however much they, sh they shifted it here and there? What but another heap, stone heap, yet more confused? But I set order, governing and choosing. Mine alone are the reins of power, and thanks to this they can pray in the silence and the shadow my stones bestow, my stones erected in the likeness of the vision in my heart. Mine is the lordship, mine the power, and the responsibility is mine alone. Nevertheless, I call on them to help me. Having well understood that the ruler is not the one who saves others, but he who calls on them to save him. For it is through me and the vision within me that is achieved the unity which I and I alone have summoned forth from my flocks and herds, my dwelling places and my mountains, in which, mark well, they love, as they would love a young goddess stretching forth her snowy arms in the sunlight, whom at first they knew not what she is, for what she is. Thus they love the house I have set up according to my vision, and through the house its architect. One who loves a statue loves not the clay, not the plaster or the bronze, but the achievement of the sculptor's mind. And I bind my people to their home, so they may come to know it little by little for what it is. Only after nourishing it <clears throat> with their lifeblood and gracing it with their sacrifices can they attain this knowledge. For it must take toll of their living flesh and blood ere it can body forth their full significance. But thereafter they cannot fail to know it for what it is, this divine structure with a human visage. Then they come to love it, and ardent will be their nightfalls. Fathers, when their sons first open their eyes and ears, will make haste to point, to point them to it, lest it should be engulfed in a diversity of things. Inasmuch as I took heed to my dwelling vast, to my dwelling vast enough to give a meaning even to the stars, thus when my people venture forth upon their thresholds at the shut of day and raise their eyes, they give thanks to God for so surely guiding the ships celestial of his firmament. And because I have made it so lasting as to encompass many lives within its span, they will go from festival to festival as they go from hill to hill, knowing where they go and discovering beyond life's infinite diversity the face of God. Therefore, my citadel, have I built you like a stout ship. I have bolted you together, ballasted you, and launched you forth into time, time which, is for, you, which for you is as, favoring, is as a favoring wind, the ship of men lacking which they would not make eternity's haven. Nonetheless, well I know the perils threatening my ship. Ever is it buffeted by dark seas, by a host of other visions of what might have been. For always is it possible to lay the temple low and build another with its stones. But that other temple would be neither more nor less true, neither more nor less just. Thus, thus none would be aware of the ruin that had befallen the essential quality of silence which was not written upon the stones. Wherefore I would have lost Wherefore, I would have them fasten stoutly the, the breastbeams of the ship, so that they may voyage in safety from generation to generation. For how could I build the temple beautiful, if ever and again I were to start it anew? 